Uh, y'all be praying for them this week and uh, praying for Josh tonight as he gets ready to come up and share God's word with us. All right, let's pray together and uh, we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much just for allowing us to be here together tonight to just worship you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you love us. We thank you for Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. We ask all these things in his holy and precious and powerful name. Amen. Stand up and uh, we'll start with hymn number 44, Victory in Jesus. And I heard no.
Brother Josh, as he comes up, Lord, I pray that uh, it's not your words or it's not his words that flow, but your words, Lord. And uh, I just pray over his message that it touches every one of us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good evening. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not as worried about it as you are. <laughs> First of all, let me just say what an awesome service this morning. God is not I was, he is not I will be, but he is I am. That's what I took out of that message this morning. He is always I am. He always has been. So tonight, I'm, as you noticed, some of you might have noticed when that flashed up there that we're not in Malachi tonight. And I know y'all were just excited about Malachi. But I'm going to switch gears because the next sermon in Malachi is tithing. And that ain't the youth pastor's job. So <laughs> um, we're going to, I'm not that I'm scared of it, um, um, but I'm definitely, I, I, it's not that I want, didn't want to preach out of Malachi, it's just that God laid something else on my heart, okay? And um, so I want to talk about success because I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed we're Crossroads has a lot of momentum right now. Uh, we've had some success. And I want to talk about how can we handle that success. Um, you'll notice it says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now that is the theme to next week's revival that I'm preaching. I will preach out of Joshua 6 next week as well, but I'm going a different direction with you guys tonight. I want you to see some different things tonight. Two, two points that I want you to see is... God is about your joy. That's what he's for. He's for your joy. And then also, people notice God when God's people are obedient. People notice God. So I know those, you're, like, you're trying to relate those two points there together. Um, don't try to. I'm not going to try to, but that's two points I want you to see out of this one message, okay? So um, if you want to put your finger on Joshua 2, that's the first place we will reference. I will be all over the first seven chapters of Joshua. So I'm going to paraphrase a lot. I'm going to read straight from the Scripture some, but if you try to follow me, uh, good luck. I will try to give you some time to keep up, but just listen mainly is where I'm going. So we've had some success, Crossroads has. And when you get in a time like that, you have to stop and think about your success and how you're going to handle your success. Um, you've got to realize that it's not you that are successful. It's not Crossroads that's successful here. It's God who is successful through us. So, how will we handle success? How will we handle success? And I just want you all to know, I went crazy just a minute ago going over my sermon notes. Um, you see a lot of black ink on the edges and stuff. That's usually not good for you guys. So, um, just stay with me though. So, what do we do when we become successful? Sometimes, and a lot of times, we tend to increase ourselves. We tend to think more highly of ourselves. Um, and this next one is kind of related to that. We become disobedient. We become disobedient to the, the Word of God. And so, when we increase ourselves out of disobedience to the Word of God, we decrease Christ. We decrease God. Because one's got to happen. We've either got to decrease and let Christ increase, or we're going to increase and let Christ decrease in our life. We're going to increase and let Christ decrease in our life. So, how do we handle this success? When we gain success, how are we going to handle it? Um, I'm reminded of Israel right here in the book of Joshua. They've, um, Moses has just died, and they're going into the promised land. It's time to go. And as you will soon see, I don't know if Israel suffers from some kind of form of ADD, but they get the promised land. God says, I will pour joy into your life and I will give you the promised land, Israel. And they get it and they're like, hallelujah, praise God, God is king. And then they do this and they walk off with the prize and they forget where the success came from. So we must not be like that. We must respond to success biblically. We must respond to success biblically. So, one of the reasons we tend to increase ourselves is because of disobedience. What's the number, number one 
reason that you, think about this as yourself, why you disobey God's Word. What's the number one reason? I don't know what you came to, but what I came to is a point of disbelief. Uh, maybe I don't truly believe exactly everything that it says word for word. Um, that one area that I'm struggling with, that one sin that I'm struggling with, is because I don't truly believe what God's Word says about it. So, we, we handle success biblically. So you must believe what the Bible says. So, let's jump into Joshua. Um, like I said, I'll... I'm going to kind of paraphrase as we go along, so I'm not going to read. Sometimes I won't read directly from Scripture. Uh, sometimes I will. I'll let you know when I will. Uh, Joshua 1, Moses has died. Joshua takes over. God comes to Joshua and speaks to Joshua. says, Moses, my servant is dead. It is time for you to take over and cross the Jordan. Cross the Jordan. Go in and take the land I have promised to you and I have promised to your fathers. So it's been a long time coming. Joshua knew it was coming. Um, Forty years he's waited. They, he's wanted to go in for a long time. So Joshua takes command. And God commands Joshua. Now you've got to understand that it's not just, hey, take my people and go into the promised land. I trust you. It's listen to what I have to say. Listen to my words. Listen to my commands. God commands Joshua to do as Moses was commanded. All the laws that I have given Moses, you keep. You keep them in your mouth and you meditate on them daily, Scripture says. So it's not just, hey, have at it. Here's your prize. Here's your success. You deserve it. It's do as I command. Do as I uh, wish. Cross the Jordan. He also says, seek me. Remember, he told Moses to seek counsel with him. So, so seek me. Seek God in everything that you do. And I will be with you. I will fight the battle. So they cross the Jordan. He, he gets this word from, from God and he, he, he tells the people to pre prepare. We are going to cross the Jordan. Now, I, I find something um, interesting in that. He, he tells them three days ahead of time. That's not so that people can um, um, take their time getting ready. That shows the amount of people who are there. It's a lot of people. It takes three days to prepare to move across the Jordan. Okay, that's just to prepare to get there. Okay, so there's a lot of people. I just find that interesting that uh, when we look at these stories, sometimes we just see Joshua and we just see the the, the army, uh, but there's a lot more in in it than that. Okay, there's a lot of people in this. So God tells Joshua to cross the Jordan, and Joshua passes this command on to the people of Israel. God, and excuse me, I'm biting sinuses and dry mouth of, so, and Regina's Mexican food, so, <laughs> so bear with me. All right, so God, God tells Joshua, as he told Moses, go in the promised land. I have gone before you. I will fight for you. I will fight the battle. You just be obedient. Be obedient, and I have fought the battle. So, we we get in a little bit as we see the story of Rahab, this amazing story with the spies and Rahab. We, we see that God does fight the battles. He has already fought the battles. He fought them for Moses. The battle was already fought for Moses. So as he goes in and, and Rahab, he sends the spies to Rahab. And what Rahab, this is Joshua 2, verse 10. And, and these spies, they, they are housed at Rahab's house. And listen to what she says. Verse 10 of, of chapter 2 in Joshua says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before, when you, uh, before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who, you, uh, excuse me, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Now notice verse 11. And as soon as we heard it, the people of Jericho, this is where Rahab is, as soon as uh, we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. You see, they were ready to give up. The people of Jericho in the day of Moses, they were already ready to turn over the land. They were ready to leave. There was no spirit. There was no will to fight in them. 
And so they were ready to just, it would be more, instead of battle, it would be more of surrender. But, as we all know, Moses uh, was not able to go into the promised land because of disobedience, because of hesitancy. All right? So, the promised land was already given up. Uh, they would have, at the sight of Moses, they would have been ready to surrender. But now, it's different 40 years later. God will still be with them, no doubt. But in order to claim victory, there will be a battle. There will be battle at Jericho. They will still be victorious, but they still will have to battle. So, they, they, they get ready to go to, to, uh, go to Jericho. And, and fight these people. Remember a, a fight that they probably wouldn't have had to battle in the time of Moses, but hesitation caused disobedience. And, and then because of this disobedience, uh, they must battle. Now, there, there definitely must be a battle. So you see, these people noticed God while God's people were obedient. You see that? In the time of Moses, when they came out of Egypt and the Exodus, and they, they now can you put yourself in, in the Israelites' uh, shoes here. They're coming out of Egypt. They're on the flee, They're on the run, and they are headed towards the Red Sea. And they see the Red Sea, and they look behind them, and they see the Egyptian army pressing in on them. And and they get down there, and, and, and what do they say to Moses when they get trapped? When they get pinned down, what do they say to Moses? They say, "Why have you brought us here to die? Were there no graves in Egypt that we could have been buried in? We told you this when you were here." Just to leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. But now you've brought us into the wilderness and we're pinned down and we're about to die. And what does Moses say? Stand firm. Do not fear. Stand firm. For the salvation of the Lord is at hand. You will see the salvation of the Lord today. What He has prepared for you today. And they were obedient to that. They were obedient. They stayed. Could you imagine if they had scattered across the wilderness? They would have, one, been caught. Or two, be killed. And the Red Sea would have never been parted. Because God wouldn't have parted the Red Sea for disobedient people. You see, uh, I don't know why we today expect God to part the Red Sea for us when we're disobedient. So God notices when, or people, people notice God when His people are obedient. So the Israelites were obedient, God split the Red Sea. They moved in. So let's get back to Joshua. We chased um, a rabbit there, I'm sorry. So let's get back to Joshua. Spies returned from Jericho to Israel and they decide to move into the plains of Jericho and set up camp now we're into Joshua 6 in Joshua 6 it's it starts a really God starts to write a, a really cool story of for Israel we don't I don't really know how Joshua got into the counsel of God but he definitely was he, he sought God because it says starting in verse 2 of chapter 6, and the Lord said to Joshua, so he definitely was in uh, the counsel of the Lord. Uh, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war. Now, we kind of skipped up. All the men of war would be around, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, would be around 40,000 people. Uh, so anyway, they... they it says, for them to march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram ho ram's horns before the ark. And that's the ark of the covenant, not Noah's ark. On the seventh day, that was a joke, by the way. Um, on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, when you hear that long blast, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. So, that's a lot. That's a lot to think about. That's a lot to do. Uh, Joshua was just one man. That's why he sought God. He sought the Lord. We're just one people. We must seek God's counsel. So, God gives Joshua instruction, gives him detailed instruction. Nothing's really left up for Joshua to decide. It's detailed instruction. Um, he gives him instruction of everything he's supposed to do. And God gives us instruction today. He gives us instruction through his word. That's where we can find God's instruction for our life. So, back into Joshua 6, he, he gets them ready, gets the men of war ready, and for six days they march 
around this. The first day, they march around once. Second day, the same thing. Trumpets blowing the whole time. They march around. They march around. And that, now, picture Josh's humility here and the men of, of the army. Picture their humility. They're, they're marching around. You've got 40,000 men marching around a city with seven priests blowing into ram's horn and the Ark of the Covenant marching before them once a day for six days. Now, imagine um, the humility that must go on. You know, on top of the wall, there was definitely archers. That was a common thing for cities back in those days, and there was definitely watchmen. Now, can you imagine these watchmen and these archers seeing these men marching around the city, these grown men marching around listening to uh, seven guys dressed up in funky robes blowing on ram's horn? Um, I know that there, I, I say I know, I suspect that there was some mocking going on from the people of, of Jericho. Now remember, they can't say a word these six days, these six times around. They can't say one word. So I, I can just imagine on that sixth day uh, or fifth day that one of the archers saying, can I just shoot the guys with the trumpets? That's all I'm asking. I just want to shoot those guys that are blowing those trumpets. But you, you see the humility of Joshua here and, and the, the men of the army. They were obedient. And they're, these people are fixing to notice God. The people of Jericho are fixing to notice God. So, on the seventh day, seven times around, they march and they march. Then the trumpet sounds with a big blast, a, a loud blast, uh, not normal to what they've been hearing. And on that blast, they all shout, and we know the story, the wall falls down. So why did the wall fall? Have you ever stopped to think about why the wall fell? And a lot of people say it was because of the trumpet and, and the shouts. And I've even heard in VBS one time when I was a kid that it was because of the vibration of their voice. I'm thinking, well, that might be so, but I'm going to guarantee you that if they had shouted on the fifth lap, the wall wouldn't have, wouldn't have fell. It would not have fell. So why did the wall fall? Obedience. Obedience to God's Word. The obstacle fell at obedience. You see, God commanded, and they did exactly as He commanded, and the obstacle fell. You ever wonder why some of the obstacles in your life won't fall? Why they won't move? Jesus says if we just have the faith the size of a mustard seed, we can tell this mountain to move, and it will move. I love this song that I've been hearing on radio. Our problems, our trials, they're only a mountain. They're only a mountain. It's only an obstacle. So, obedience. Obedience. Are you being obedient? Are you seeking the counsel of the Lord? Alright, so the walls have fallen. Back into Jericho. The walls have fallen. And the Israelites prepared to march in and take victory. Claim victory. But see... We've got to back up and rewind just a little bit. Let's go back to uh, the end of verse 16 in chapter 6 and let's see what God tells Joshua to do, how to handle this success. Let's see how, how we are to handle the success. This is the, the, the last part of 16 going all the way through verse 19 of chapter 6. It says, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute, that would be the ones who house the, the spies, only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she, she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take... Excuse me. Let me back up. It says, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction. And you bring trouble upon it. In other words, if you mess with anything that I'm telling you, you have devoted Israel now. You have, have consumed the camp of Israel uh, with trouble. Verse 19. This is the hard part for me. This is where I would struggle. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So God gives Joshua some, some instruction on how, how to handle this success, how to handle this victory. He tells him um, to, to leave the devoted things alone. They're not yours. They're the Lord's. Um, the first fruits 
are always God's. That's basically what he's saying here. This is the first battle of your journey into the promised land. And the first fruits from this battle are the Lord's. Now, imagine coming in here this evening and someone had come by and filled all the pews up with stacks of $100 bills. And I told you, I said, hey, uh, someone just donated all this money to uh, the Church of Crossroads. And I want you to get as much as you can and put it in your car and follow Michael to the bank and we're going to deposit this money. But on the way there, don't touch one bill. It's devoted to the Lord. Um, that might be hard for some people. Uh, maybe just slip a bill out of this stack and a bill out of this stack. No one will notice just one bill missing. And um, so that's kind of how they're facing this. Jericho was a wealthy nation. You've got to understand this. The Bible does it. it. It alludes to it, but history tells us that Jericho was wealthy. They had a lot of stuff, and that's one reason they had such tall walls, such impenetrable walls, because they had a lot of stuff. All right. So these guys have got to go in, these men of war, they've got to go in, and they can't touch any of the silver, any of the gold, any of the jewels. They've got to leave them for the treasury of the Lord. They're devoted, it says. So, let's move on. Israel has victory. I want to skip ahead to, I'm not really skipping, I guess. I want to jump over to, to chapter 7. And don't read, don't read verse 1 of chapter 7. Stop reading it. Just go to verse 2. Verse 1 is the spoiler. It's kind of, this, that, this chapter was wrote for Larry. Um, it gives you the end, you know. So, um, so let's skip to, to verse 2, all right? And they move on and they set up camp for Ai. They're outside of the, the Jericho again. They're in the plains of Jericho, and they're headed towards Ai. Joshua sends two spies to Ai. Uh, it doesn't really show who he consulted here, really. It doesn't really speak directly who he consulted. I, I can say that it probably wasn't the Lord, because it never says in here, then the Lord said to Joshua. Um, so I'm guessing that he sought counsel with his elders. That was a common practice. And also generals of the army. That was a common practice. So the, the spies come back from Ai and they tell, they tell Joshua, man, Ai is tiny. They're small. Don't worry about them. There's no need to send this whole army up to Ai and tool up there, the, word, the, the, the Bible says, and, and to basically waste your time in going in circles over Ai. We would probably harm ourselves more than we would Ai. So don't send the whole army. Send 3,000 men. So Joshua likes this idea apparently because 3,000 men go to Ai. They set out and they leave almost immediately for Ai. Now, it doesn't really tell much of the battle of Ai. There's not really much that went on other than when they got there, Israel quickly turned. You'll read on, we'll read on in just a minute, you'll see what God says about it. He says they have turned their backs on their enemies. They literally got there and turned around and ran. Israel did. Mighty Israel got to Ai, little bitty Ai, and turn around. And in that process, the Bible tells us that 36 men were killed. 36 Israelites were killed in this battle. And they get back to the camp and they say, I don't know what's, what they saw, what the spies saw in Ai, but what we saw in Ai was different. And we have been defeated at Ai. And the word gets back to Joshua. And it, it is not good news to him. He, it says that he falls on his face, tears his clothes, and pours ashes on his head or dirt on his head. And he looks to God and he says, why have you done this to us, God? Why us? Why have you brought us here for destruction? We will surely be defeated now. All the countries around Ai will hear about this. They will surely hear about it. They will join together and they will come and they will remove us from the land. And then notice what he says in verse 9. This is Joshua speaking, verse 9 of chapter 7. It says, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Now notice this last sentence. And what will you do for your great name? Um, look, God, I don't know how we got here, but what are you going to do to fix it? Basically is what he's saying. We do that today. We get into a spot in our life and we're like, look, God, I don't know how you got us here, but um, how are you going to fix it? Well, God didn't get you there. God didn't get them there to AI, to the destruction of AI. So, what do we do? What does God do? God's going to fix it. God always will fix it if we seek obedience and seek counsel with Him. He says there's sin in the camp. Go to verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Israel has sinned. Now we go back to verse 1 of chapter 7. The spoiler. Let's read what it says. It says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Remember that stuff that was devoted to God, the first fruits. 
It says, For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, did I say that right? <laughs> Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, n- notice, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. God kept his promise. That's basically what verse 1 tells us. God kept his promise. Remember, he said, Don't take of the devoted things unless you bring trouble upon the camp or upon Israel. That's exactly what happened. There's sin in the camp. And as you, as you read through chapter 7, Joshua confronts the sin, Israel confronts the sin, and they take care of the sin. They take care of it. So we today still have to do that. We have to confront our sin, we have to face it, and then we have to take care of it. We have to take care of it. We have to repent. Remember, repent. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago when I preached. It's basically a 180 turn from your sin. It's not that you won't ever fall to that sin again, but it's not your desire anymore. So Israel had to repent of their sin, and if you keep on reading through chapter 8, you'll see that that little bitty AI is as small as the spies said it was. And they were as victorious as God said they would be. So, today, what's required? Um, what do we, do? we obviously aren't under the law anymore. We are not. Uh, the law has been fulfilled. So what, how do we keep ourselves from being devoted to destruction? Um, ask yourself another question. How did Joshua and Israel increase themselves above God? First, Joshua didn't seek counsel of the Lord. Had he sought counsel of the Lord, he would have told him, God would have told Joshua the exact same thing he said in verse 10. Hey, there's sin in the camp. Before you go to Ai, let's take care of this sin in the camp, and then let's move on. But instead, Joshua flipped the order, and he went to Ai first, and then tried to take care of the sin. And that doesn't work. You can't, you can't get out of order. Confront the sin first, move on to victory. So, Joshua thought, hey, they're small. I got this one handled. I can take care of this one without you, God. I got this one handled. Second, disobedience. See, one man's sin, Achan's disobedience, one man's sin contaminated the entire nation, the entire people. Your sin can, it doesn't sometimes only affect you. Your sin sometimes affects your, your family as well. Your sin also can affect your church family as well. So that's why we must be obedient. Confront your sin. So what is required today to be obedient? Uh, in, in the favor of Christ. What is required? Number one, and first and foremost, is have you sought Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you accepted the gift of salvation that only Jesus gives? Then if you have, have you given your life completely to Him? Have you started being obedient? If you've been saved, have you been baptized? Let's start there. That's a good spot for obedience, to start obedience. And then, give your life. And I mean everything. Mark eight thirty four through 36 you don't have to go there, just listen. It says, and calling the crowd, this is Jesus, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's, will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So, have you truly given your life completely to Christ? Luke 14, 26 goes on to say, if anyone comes to me and does not... Now, I'm going to explain this, so don't don't be shocked when you hear this if you've never heard this verse. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And you look at that and you're like, whoa. What does that mean? Um, Let me put it to you this way. What if you lived in Iraq and your family was devout um, Islam and you were a converted Christian? The first person you don't tell is your dad. You don't go tell your, your Islamic father that you have converted to Christianity. He doesn't care. He will have you arrested. And then you will ultimately probably either be executed or exiled. So, but as a Christian, to be a disciple, you must go. You must do stuff. And if your dad's holding you back, if your dad doesn't want you to follow Christ, you must be ready to leave. That's all that says. You, the willingness. 
Are you willing to completely follow Jesus? So, it doesn't mean that to accept Christ that you immediately have to leave your family. That's not what that's meaning. But Christ requires everything. All right, so if I'm an unbeliever and I don't know this Jesus and I read this verse or if I was there and I heard him speak that my first thought would be, well, it was wow. Wow, who is this guy that makes these claims? Who is this guy that can say this stuff? I mean, it would seem to me that he had very serious egotistical problems. He was, very, he was a, a, a monomaniac, you could say. He had serious issues to be able to say this stuff. I mean, he suffers from severe monomania. That's what, that's what I see. But, but, listen to me. If I said that, that would be a legit um, comment. You could say, hey, Josh is very much a monomaniac. He has very, very big issues. If I said that, no one would follow me. There's no one that would. But So why does Jesus get to say this? Why does Jesus get to say these things? You see, Jesus would be a monomaniac. He would be if He were only human. But you see, He's a Savior. He's a Savior, so He gets to say those things. Because doing what He says gives you life. So He does get to say those things. I want to call Brad up here. I didn't go too long. I only skipped four pages. So, no. I want to call Brad up here though. I want this to be a serious time for you. Are you ready to accept Jesus as your Savior? And maybe you already have. Maybe you already have, but are you ready to face the sin in your life? The sin, are you ready to confront that sin and move on? Confront it, deal with it, and move on to victory. Confront sin, move on to victory. Are you ready to confess and repent the sin in your life? Even that we talked about Wednesday night with the teens, that secret sin. That sin only you know about. That sin that you're so ashamed of you don't want anybody else to know. Are you ready to face that and move on to victory? Because that sin holds you back from victory tonight. So, if you haven't confessed the sin that you struggle with, if you haven't done that, would you do that tonight? Would you start tonight and get ready to move on to victory? As, as Brad sings, I just want this altar to be an open spot. I'm here to listen to you. I'm here to talk to you. Uh, Brother Larry will be right there in his spot worshiping, but he don't mind if you interrupt him as well. So just tonight, let's stand. And let's just let this time of response be that time for you maybe to work out the problems in your life. The, the problems that more than likely came from disobedience to God's Word. That's probably where it started. So let's work that out tonight. You know, we do have a tendency to increase, don't we? And we see it over and over in the Scripture. God would do great things, and the people would say, Oh, God, you are so amazing. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. And it was no time till they turned their back on God and started building themselves up and building themselves up. 
Uh, we tend to do that even today. And we shouldn't. We can't. God is God, and we're not. We're just flawed, messed up people. And without him, we're doomed, messed up people. Uh, thank God that he loves us enough to give us grace that we do not deserve. Thank God that he's called us to obedience. And that when people look at our obedience, they see not us, but him. It's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, I pray that we will always remember that we must decrease and he must increase. It's not about us. It's all about him. Everything we do, everything we say, every bit of our lives is all about God. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate that message. And I thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, don't forget Wednesday night. All right. We've got uh, Awana Youth Group. Brother Robert's uh, Bible study will be meeting out in the fellowship hall. A lot of stuff going on Wednesday night. Don't forget tomorrow night. Okay. Tomorrow night will be the ladies' ministry. Tuesday night, Forge, the men's ministry. Please be here for that. Invite somebody to come to that. I know God's going to be doing great things in those two uh, ministries this week. And, uh, and I'm just excited to see what's going to happen. Aren't you? I could tell. Ooh, I got chills. No, no. All right, let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, God for this church. Thank you for the love that is in this place between these people. God, we pray tonight that you will use us to love one another, to love this community, to love the people all around that we run into this week, God, that we will love them not so that they will love us, but so that they will see you. And God, that through that they may come to know you and that they may have life, God. And we know that that is your will for everybody. And we just pray, God, that you use us this week. Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for Jesus. We ask this in his holy and precious name. Amen.